I work on, on motoneuron disease. I, I was told to just make a very brief introduction on the topic just for the people that have never heard about it. Uh, motoneuron diseases are actually clinically characterized by the loss of the control of the voluntary movement of the skeletal muscle uh, and is associated to weakness and or spasticity depending upon the type of motoneuron which is affected in these diseases. But muscle atrophy is always present uh, and uh, this will cause also often death for respiratory failure. And um, the ma vast majority of these motoneuron diseases are fatal disorders. There is no cure available for that. The motoneurons are located in a cerebral cortex or in the spinal cord and this may provide different clinical uh, course of the disease depending upon the type of motor neurons that are affected. If upper motor neurons are lost, you have a spasticity, so you have all this spectrum of disorders in which you lose the control <coughs> of the reflex arch. And if you have lower motor neuron disorders, when you lose the lower motor neurons in the anterior horn of the spinal cord, you actually have a, a flexicity. But there is also a combination of motor neuron diseases in which upper and lower motor neuron are lost, like in the case of ALS. Uh, we must also say that not only motor neurons are affected, but even other neurons in the brain can be affected. There is a, um, a large spectrum of the clinical sign in motor neuron disorders. In ALS, you may have even frontotemporal dementia with the same type of mutation. So, the disease is, is not really clear and the um, damage that a single protein may induce in a specific motor neurons is not actually very well known. But also other um, cells can be affected, like for example, muscle are direct target of toxicity of many of the proteins that are involved in uh, motor neuron disorders. From a um, clinical point of view, this is the story, upper or lower motor neurons or a mixture of phenotype. But if you think about the uh, outcome of these motor neurons, we have sporadic and inherited form, as in many cases of disease in human. Uh, we cannot say much about the sporadic, so we have to focus on inherited, and this can be due to a mutant gene that code for a mutant. Uh, usually we think about a mutant protein, but it can also be a mutant RNA or an RNA which may exert toxicity in uh, neurons. We, you have dysregulation of RNA function, RNA metabolism. I will focus my talk on the problems that are caused by alteration at the protein level. But you can have a loss of function and gain of function. We have Motor neurons that are clearly associated to loss of function, other that are clearly associated to gain of function. But the problem is often we see that there is a combination of gain and loss of function. And the gain of function may be cause of the loss of function. This is make the picture quite complex when you try to understand what happened in motor neurons and how you can counteract the toxicity of a given protein in motor neurons. We work on two different uh, motor neuron disorders. They are spinal bulbar muscular atrophy and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, SBMA, uh, spinal bulbar muscular atrophy, is always inherited and is due to a mutation in the androgen receptor, which is located in the X chromosomes. And there is an expansion and the gene coding for the androgen receptor, a CAG repeat, which is expanded, a code for a polyglutamic tract, which seems to confer toxicity to this protein. I will present some of the data on this uh, particular protein. And we work also on ALS. There are sporadic form and inherited. The majority, the vast majority, are sporadic cases. And, but the inherited form are very interesting. There are mutation in the um, SOD1, the superoxide dismutase uh, gene that could for run enzymes. This was this historically the first one that was identified. But there are, uh, it, but account only for 15, 20 percent of the 10 cases of sporadic, so it's really rare. There are other mutations that have recently been identified, TDP43, fused optineurin. Actually, they occur in a very limited number of patients. But there is something very interesting that some of these proteins that are mutated in this uh, inherited form often have a, an aberrant behavior also in their wild type form in a, a sporadic LS. 
So we, we can, for example, look at the TDP43. TDP43 is mutated in very few cases of uh, familiar LS, but it misbehaves, it has aberrant behavior in almost all uh, sporadic form LS. So it's a sort of protein that is involved also in sporadic cases, and this may suggest that there are common mechanisms of toxicity that affect motor neurons in familiar and sporadic form. But we cannot actually produce model for sporadic, but we can easily produce model for familiar form. We can take advantage of that. It may be even true for the androgen receptor. In fact, we have a gender difference uh, related to um, male and female difference in the onset and progression of LS, especially in the juvenile form, where the hormonal steroids may change the situation. And they may possibly be linked to an aberrant effect of the androgen receptor, which is a uh, cause of a uh, motor neuron disease. But what they have in common, this protein, because actually the androgen receptor, the transcription factors, the mutant SOD1, the SOD1 is an enzyme, TDP43, is a protein that bind DNA, RNA, and et cetera. And uh, the C9 NARF72 is actually not even translated into a protein. It can be translated, in, as I will show you, in a D-peptide. But there's nothing in common from a physiological point of view. Or they do not share any single domain. What they have in common is that when they are mutated, they can acquire a band conformation. And this is a big problem for the cells. This is called misfolding. And there are now reclassified as a misfolding diseases. If a protein acquire a barren conformation, it causes a series of damage inside the cells, may start a process of deposition, may accumulate, may form aggregates, may damage mitochondria, axonal transport, dysregulated transcription, etc., etc. So the problem is how can we counteract the misfolding of this protein, which is actually maybe a trigger for the disease. The cells have developed actually um, an important system to counteract the, the presence of misfolded proteins in the cells. And this, pro is, this, this um, system is called the protein quality control system, which is composed of molecular chaperons and the degradative pathway. And we have two degradative pathways that are the proteasome and the autophagic system. We can include in that also the unfolded protein response, which is associated to the degradation at the level of the endoplasmic reticulum, which is also part of the protein quality control. But I, I will not talk about that today. The chaperons are a huge family of proteins subdivided in subfamily. They were called historically HSP40, HSP90, HSP70, uh, depending upon the molecular weight of these proteins. Actually, they are being reclassified as DNAJ for HSP40, HSPA, HSPC, etc., etc. This is not a really important, except for because, except for the fact that these have specific function in the mechanism of folding of the protein. And we'll just spend a minute on a minute on that. The HSP70 is the, probably the most important one because in conjunction with HSP40, DNA J, it recognizes misfolded species and using ATP and with the assistance of the uh, nuclear exchange factor bags, it folds the protein. It, it confer the correct conformation in a different step uh, are required to reach the right conformation. Uh, when this is almost finished, it is required the assistance of the HSP90 and the chaperonins to fold properly the protein. And, and, and probably you have a, only a single or two different alternative conformations that may exist in the cells and are that the one that confirm the activity of this protein. If something goes wrong, they have to be cleared away from the cells. This is a basic uh, <coughs> mechanism, but during stress, you have another uh, series of chaperons that are the smallest shock proteins that are able to recognize protein that lose the correct conformation and they just help the machinery, the, the core machinery, to refold these components or to decide the fate of the protein. I will come back on this uh, smallish shock protein because this will be the topic of my talk. 
Then we have the protease zone. This is a very famous derivative system. If the uh, HSP70, HSP40 fail, they cannot be recognized or uh, fold properly the protein. They associate it with CHIP, and this will ubiquitinate the substrate, ubiquitinate substrate of recognized by the protease zone, and they are cleared away. This is a high specificity, specificity low capacity system. But we also have another system, which is alternative, but we're in conjunction with the protease zone, and this is the autophagy. We have different types of autophagy, macroautophagy, microautophagy, and chaperone-mediated autophagy. We will um, focus on microautophagy. This is a high uh, capacity but low specificity uh, system. So it can recognize huge component, but it has a low specificity. <laughs> and if it works in this way, um, protein or organelles or even aggregates can be engulfed into the uh, phagophores that then mature to the autophagosome and the uh, autophagosome then fuse to the lysosome to give rise to autophagolysosome where the proteolytic enzyme destroy all the components that are entrapped into the autophagosomes. The problem here is that the system is very good and uh, we can survive for many years with no problem in our cells. But uh, at some point something can go wrong, can go wrong and um, the PQC system protect against any kind of proteotoxicity, protein that are damaged by stress. But the proteotoxic stress can impair the uh, PQC system. For example, they may overwhelm the proteasome. That is a big problem. So you have a sort of vicious cycle in which proteotoxicity can be exacerbated by the failure of the PQC system. And probably this is one of the problems that we have in, in neurons that are continuously producing misfolded proteins since the time they are born because the genus is mutated and they have to handle with this protein for the entire life. And the, the PQC system also declines usually in the function during age. And we start with this BMA. This is the, the mutation, a CAG repeat. It is normally around 22 in, in the population. And the patients are longer than 30. Okay? It's double in the size. But it can be even 60, 70. It's located in the exon 1 of the androgen receptor and in the transactivation domain of the androgen receptor, which retain almost completely its function. I, I'm showing you that because uh, this is the, the, side, the region of the protein where the testosterone binds to the androgen receptor and the testosterone activated the androgen receptor. As I will show you in a minute, this, this is important to understand some of the experiments I will show you. Uh, this was cloned in the 91, and, after, and it was the, the first gene that was associated to a neurogenerative disorders, clearly associated. But the, the polycule is a particular stretch in the protein, so a lot of scientists look for other polycule, other CAG repeating other proteins, and actually we have now a family of protein that contain CAG that are expanded, that are all responsible for neurogenerative disorders. This is a case of antintin for a... Uh, 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 Antington disease, atrophy, and uh, several type of uh, ataxin for a uh, spinal cerebral ataxin. The advantage to use androgen receptor is that, well, actually, this is actually probably the, 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 the largest uh, family of uh, neurogenerative diseases associated to a specific mutation that we know. But the uh, advantage to use the androgen receptor is we know exactly what the androgen receptor does in the cells. It's very well-known protein. It was cloned in the 80s, studied since the 70s. So we know exactly how it works. And we don't know much about the other proteins. So this is a big advantage because you can discriminate between physiological and pathological uh, defect of this uh, protein. The second advantage came from the clin clinical observation is some experimental data that were collected in intergenic mice. First of all, SBMA uh, only affect male. And if you produce a transgenic mice, uh, mice, only males are affected. This is strange because, well, uh, in, in human, it's possible this is associated to X chromosomes. So you have random inactivation of the X chromosomes. You may have half of the uh, cells that are protected because they do not express the mutant allele. This is an explanation. But why in mice, where the uh, allele is randomly integrated into the genomes? The females are not affected. But if you do this, you concentrate the mice before symptom onset, 
the, the, the mice do not develop the disease, but if you treat the females that normally do not develop the disease with testosterone, they have the disease, they have symptoms of the disease. So this is a testosterone-dependent disease. It is the second advantage to use the androgen receptor as a model, because you can just have a protein that has no toxicity inside the cells, but if you treat with testosterone and you trigger toxicity of the protein, you can follow this process. The way we explain that now, after many, many years, is that we know that the androgen receptor is confined in a multi complex in the cytoplasm protected by shock proteins in a pre-fold conformation. Now, when testosterone uh, and the uh, polycule is probably masked by the ischia proteins, when the testosterone binds to the receptor, induces a dissociation from the ischia protein, that's a, require a change in conformation to activate the receptor. And the polycule may prevent this change in conformation, conferring uh, misfolding of this protein. Then the receptor has to translocate it in the nuclei and they may acquire a barren property because of the polycule, and we know that there is nuclear toxicity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the magic trick is here: you induced the misfolding by adding a single ligand. And in fact, if you do that and you look at the cells that express mutant androgen receptor, this is GFP tagged. This is a situation with a normal receptor, and this is a mutant androgen receptor in absence of testosterone, not toxic version. If you treat with testosterone, no problem with the wild type, but this induce aggregation in the <coughs> mutant androgen receptor. So if you induce the change in conformation, the protein is full, and the androgen receptor start to form aggregate. And you can follow these aggregates easily in many ways. These aggregates contain uh, HSP70, that's an index that the PQC, protein quality control system, is altered. They contain ubiquitin, and this is a signal that uh, for to, to send protein to the proteasome, so maybe the proteasome is impaired. Uh, we know that the androgen receptor is normally processed via the proteasome. If you block the proteasome, we end up with a huge accumulation of the wild type and the mutant androgen receptor. What's about the mutant androgen receptor that is, has been dissociated from the um, uh, issue of proteins? We had to measure the, the activity of the proteasome. We can do that by using reported protein like this one. Uh, this is a GFP protein, uh, which uh, a, a, a short digron was uh, linked as a chimeric protein, and this drives the degradation of the GFPU, this protein, to the proteasome. If the proteasome works properly, you just remove the reporter. If the proteasome is saturated, and, and the condition that you want to test, the, the YFPU accumulated in the cells. So what happened? If we express the wild type receptor, plus or minus testosterone, not in change. But if we express the mutant androgen receptor and it's not toxic action, it has to be cleared away by the protosome, but it has a very long polycule. We do see an accumulation of YFPU, so the protosome is impaired. And the polycule is very long, so uh, it, this is possible due to the long sides of the polycule that may overwhelm the capability of the protosome to clear away this stretch of, of amino acid. Uh, if we look to the condition in which we, with testosterone induced toxicity, actually the, 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 uh, the reporter is just cleared away. So the proteasome in this condition just work very well. This is exactly the opposite of what we were expecting. We also measure survival, and we noted that the survival increase in our cells, and uh, this is the, uh, another way to show exactly the same uh, story, the accumulation of IPO. So we have this situation in which uh, the chaperone in some way protect from the misfolding, <coughs> you induce the release from the chaperones, you induce the misfolding, and the protein has to be cleared away by the protein. But the large excess of protein has to be dried through the clearance mediated by the protein may overwhelm the capability of the protein. But fortunately, the protein start to form aggregates for some reason, maybe because of the interaction polycule, polycule, and this will sequester the protein from the protein and will desaturate the protein. So in this view, the, the, at, at least at the beginning, the cytoplasmic aggregates are protective because they just uh, allow the cells to have a protein that still work in the cells. It is not blocked. But they have to be removed. They cannot stay there for the entire life. So and now uh, the autophagic system came over and has to be able to remove these aggregates by engulfing into the autophagosomes and remove that by 
clearance with the uh, lysosome and enzymes. It's not easy to study autophagy, actually. Uh, we have two markers, our NC3 and P62. Uh, we can use in this way, SC3 decores the autophagosome, so if autophagy is activated, you have a shift of NC3 between a diffuse staining to a punctate staining. You can follow this in, in a microscopy. NC3 is also very expressed when autophagy is activated, so you can measure RNA. And uh, it has to be clear the way because the membrane of the autophagosome fused to the lysosome, NC3 is degraded. So it's not easy to predict if you have an increase of NC3 protein in the punctate status, is an uh, autophagy that go to the end, or is an autophagy flux blockage. So you have to combine this with P62, which is the protein that recognizes the ubiquitin at the substrate to be directed to the autophagosomes. That is also overexpressed in, uh, in, uh, when autophagy is activated. It's also clear the way when uh, autophagy go to the end, but when autophagy is blocked, start to aggregate forming PCC2 bodies. So if you have this condition with PCC2 bodies, you can predict that autophagy is blocked. What happened in our cells? This is wild type, so we cannot spend time on that. This is the condition in which we have the androgen receptor minus testosterone, non-toxic version, uh, proteasome impairment, if you remember, and we have a mind activation of autophagy. Then you can note the punctate staining of LC3. Uh, I'm not showing you that, but there is also an increase of LC3, mRNA, in, in increased level of protein. But this is a condition in which you have uh, proteasome desaturation, toxic version of the androgen receptor, aggregation, and a huge amount of NC3 in a punctate staining. So is overactivation or is it autophagic flux blockage? Is autophagic flux blockage because if you look at the P62, you see that P62 co-localize with the aggregates of the androgen receptor. These are all cells, these are endogenous P62, only in cells in which you have aggregates, you have accumulation of P62 co-segregation with the aggregates. But there are other uh, uh, pictures clearly explain you that PCC2 bodies are present, so autophagic flux is blocked in this condition, and this is a big problem for our cells. But this is only androgen receptor. What's happened with the, uh, with the LS? I just skip all the data on SOD1 just by telling you that it's mutated. There are many, many mutations that are not hotspot, and most of the mutation cause uh, a gain of function. At least the protein retain its normal function. If you transfect cells with the uh, mutant SOD1, you do see the aggregates, like the case we have seen before. We cannot play with testosterone here, obviously, so we have to take this by, by what is said. But if you look at it um, in a Western child, you see accumulation of high molecular spaces, uh, high, mole high molecular weight species that increase when you block the protosome. So again, if you, the protosome uh, is uh, helping to remove these species, but they have to be in the monomeric form. And if you block the protosome, that is the total amount that is normally processed by the protosome. And you can measure that on filter retardation assay, and it is accumulation when you just express the mutant protein and the amount that you collect when you block the protosome. So this is clearly indicate that the proteasome remove a large fraction of the but not the entire pool because you have aggregates that are retained here. These are aggregates ubiquitinated when you block the proteasome, and you have also aggregates. So the proteasome is not uh, enough to remove uh, the entire pool of mutant proteins. And if you look in the sense, you see a large fraction of autophagosomes. It's another way to see the autophagosome. This is an electron microscopy. The autophagosome have a double membrane, and you can clearly recognize the autophagosomes in cells, any transgenic mice expressing the mutant SOD1. This is a motor neuron and spinal cord. Another protein, TDP43. Uh, we can use different version of TDP43. Classically, we can use a uh, fragment of TDP43, which have been um, reported to be present in, in a sporadic form of LS. The, the entire TDP43 is localized in the nuclei. It may mislocalize to the cytoplasm forming aggregates, and it can be cleaved to several aggregates, like including the 35 kilodalton fragment and the 25 kilodalton fragment, or in the familiar form that are some TDP43, which are truncated. So this is an N-terminal region. This is a C-terminal region of the TDP43, and you can measure what happened with this. 
if you express this one, the, the, the N-terminal fragment, you actually end up with accumulation of PCC2, so autophagy flux blockage, the autophagy is involved. If you block autophagy, you increase the amount of protein it accumulated. If you move, this is a very complex slide, so I will not spend time on that, just to, to summarize it in a, in a take-home message, if you express the, the the, uh, the two fragments, what we see is the, the one that is more prone to form aggregates is the uh, 25 kilodalton fragment that is a prion domain in the C-terminus. This is a C-terminal fragment. And uh, is the, the different fragments are processed in a different way inside the cells, mainly in, in our condition, the full length and uh, TDP43 is processed by the proteasome and also the fragment, the 35 kilodalton fragment by the proteasome. Why? The 25 is uh, processed by autophagy for some reason we still don't know, but if we overexpress the 25 kilodalton fragment, we end up again with the PCC2 bodies accumulation. So uh, again, um, autophagy flux blockage. So our, in summary, for, of, for this first part, we have this complex situation in which we have the chaperons, we have the degradative system, the proteasome seems to be active, uh, the problem seems to be located for some way in, uh, at the level of the capability of the cells to remove the aggregates via autophagy, and this causes uh, insufficient or a blockage in the autophagy flux. So having said that, what, what, can, what, what can we do with, with this situation? So how can neuron or we can improve the clearance of these the proteins inside the, the cells, uh, possibly without affecting the, 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 the normal protein, just the, the targeting the the protein, in condition in which the autophagy flux is blocked, as I try to convince you now. So we have this situation, uh, autophagy, proteasome, and the chaperones. We cannot actually find compounds that are really able to induce proteasome activity. There are some, but they are not really uh, efficient. Uh, so we cannot work on the proteasome. We have a lot of drugs that uh, en enhance the autophagy activity. There are activators like rapamycin, trolling <coughs> one, there are many, uh, trialose. But the, the problem is, what can you do if you try to enhance autophagy if the flux is blocked. So that is not a, a solution. You have to remove the block, the, the problem that prevents the degradation of the aggregates. So the only way is trying to work on the chaperon maybe, but the problem is which one? We have hundreds of protein. Why we have to select one specifically and not the, the other one? So what, which one is the ideal chaperons? Our, our search was for the ideal chaperons, so we, we focus our attention on that class of small issue proteins because they are activated during stress. And proteotoxicity, the, the, the presence of the proteins in the neurons is a stress for the neurons, a big stress. So the response should involve the small issue proteins. And these small issue proteins are very important because they may assist the HSP70, the ATP-dependent chaperons, in the refolding process. And it's a big, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, big new for the cells. Or they may even assist the, de the degradation to the proteasome or to the autophagy with mechanisms that are now um, a little bit more clear than in the past. There are 10 uh, small issue proteins, 1 to 10, easy. Uh, but only a few of that are expressed in the brain. Uh, some are expressed exclusively in a specific tissue, like in the testes. There are four in the brain. Um, most of that are expressed in the glial cells. Uh, B8 and B5 are also present in neurons. But we choose B8 for a, a specific reason. First of all, B8 is mutated in uh, Charcot-Marie Tooth disease, or uh, a distal motor neuropathy, which is a motor neuron disorder, so it may have an impact on a, a motor neuron. The mutation of HSBB8 causes an altered lysosomal delivery to the autophagosome, so impairment of the activity of HSBB8 in this disease is involved in autophagic uh, pathway. Third, if we block the proteasome, it's a condition that I showed you before, may, have, may cause damage in the cells, we have a huge upregulation of HSPB8. This is the promoter activation of HSPB8. This is endogenous RNA. This is the protein. So if you block the proteasome within inhibitors, you have a huge induction of HSPB8. 
HSMB8 is expressed in, a mod in, in, in spinal cord motor neurons, like here, not much in the, in the wild type animals, and five, the activity decline with age, well, the expression decline with age, so we presume also the activity decline with age. And these are all adult onset diseases, so the motor neurons or the neurons are deprotected when you become older. If you look at the uh, transgenic mice, uh, of ALS, like G93A SOD1 mice, in the spinal cord, you do see that the end stage of the disease, the expression of HSBB8 is increased, uh, six point. It's not much. If you do real-time PCR, you say, well, it's a significant, but it doesn't mean anything. It's not much. Well, but this is the entire pool of the spinal cord. If you look at the anterior horn of the spinal cord by immunohistochemistry, you know that, that the HSBB8 is expressed almost exclusively in the spinal cord. So this is a huge increase. It can be 20 times more fold induction, also in some glial cells. And if you look at the end stage of the disease, the motor neurons that survive at the very end stage of the disease, so the ones that are probably more protected than the other, express a very, very high level of HSPB8 and have a soluble uh, uh, SOD1 that normally it aggregates when the protein, when the cells is damaged. So we like to believe that these motor neurons survive because they express very high level of HSPB8. But we have not proved that yet. Then we also have toxicity of SOD1 and many other protein and the muscle cells I mentioned you before. What happen in the muscle cells that express the mutant proteins? I, sorry, a huge, a huge induction of HSPB8. So, we, we like to believe that this induction is there and try to counteract the toxicity of the misfolded protein in these particular cells. But we have to prove that. What is the effect of HSPB8 on the misfolded protein which are associated to motor neuron diseases? And we will start with the androgen receptor, which is not linked to ALS, but to another motor neuron disorder, SBMA. But we have the testosterone plus and minus that will help us to understand something. So we can induce aggregation by adding testosterone, and it's here. If we overexpress HSPB8, we completely clear the way the aggregates that are retained in the filter retardation assay. Uh, this is just filtering on an acetate, uh, cellulose acetate membrane. So he has a project relative activity. If you silence HSBB8 with CRNA, this is the condition compared to that is a basic condition. If you sign an SSBB8, you end up with a huge increase in accumulation of these misfolded species. So the endogenous HSBB8 already is able to remove a large fraction of misfolded protein. And if you sign us that, you end up with the accumulation. We overexpress that, you remove the protein. Which pathway is involved? We do not have changes if in, in the function of HSBB8 if you block the protein, but if you block autophagy with 3MA, which is a, uh, autophagy inhibitors, you completely counteract the protein relative activity of HSBB8. So that means that HSBB8 need autophagy to exert this action on the protein. If you come back to the ALS-related proteins, SOD1, this is accumulation of SOD1 uh, in basal condition when you express the mutant protein, when you block the proteasm, okay, I showed you before, when you transfect HSBB8, you completely remove all the misfold species, but also when you block the proteasm. So you don't need proteasm activity, proteasomal activity to uh, have this protein to exert this action. The aggregates are completely removed, the, the, the high molecular species Molecular waste species are completely removed. The proteasome is not impaired. It may be a problem because you send a large fraction of unfolded proteins there, but everything seems to work very uh, nicely. And if you block autophagy, again, you completely counteract the activity of HSPB8 in this cells. TDP43, exactly the same story. I'm just go through very fast, quick here, here because um, just to prove that it works pretty much in all models that we have tested. This is the accumulation of the uh, N-terminal fragment, delta C, the effect of HSPB8. You can compare these two, no B8 plus B8. You can block uh, autophagy, you counteract the activity of HSPB8. You silence HSPB8, again, you have accumulation of TDP43, uh, the fragment. You have uh, accumulation of the TDP43 N-terminal fragment, N-C-terminal fragment. 
again a complex slide, but if you focus here, that there's are the fraction that are really insoluble and P40 insoluble of TDP425, uh, and you again you have a protagonality <coughs> relativity of HSPB8, and is a confirmation in uh, a monofluorescence assay. But those are proteins, so proteins that misfold are actually normally present in the cells, but we can also test this in another model that is related to uh, ALS. And exactly the C9 or 72 model. This is a um, gene that is mutated uh, and contain an expansion of a uh, G4C2, GGGCC stretch, which in ALS is expanded over 100 uh, um, repeats, but even more, even 3,000. This is in, in a region which is not translated, but actually there is an aberrant translation of this stretch, and this is ATG independent. Uh, we don't know exactly what is the mechanism for that, but there is a, the position of a peptide that contain, the peptide that contain the product of this translation. And we know, many scientists have worked on that in the recent year, that this stretch produces the peptide like GLI-R, GLI-PRO, GLI-I, ALA, and also on the um, uh, anti-sense strand which is translated of this protein. <coughs> so we have five different peptides. Those are not proteins, they are not misvoted proteins, they have no functional domain, they are just depeptide. They accumulate in the cells. Can be targeted by the HSPB8. Well, they actually accumulated, but they can be removed by the proteasome. Well, only poly PA does not accumulate in basal condition, but this removed by the proteasome. They can be removed by autophagy if you uh, block a proteasome with three uh, with MG132, which is the inhibitor for the proteasome, you show the fraction that is normally processed by the proteasome. Uh, uh, the opposite, if you block autophagy with 3MA, you show the, the difference of the total amount that it is accumulating is the, probably the fraction that is normally processed with autophagy. If you express the mutant protein plus HSPB8, again, you completely remove all the, mis all the deep peptide that are accumulating in the cells. If you use CRNA, you have accumulation. So this protein, and this is true for all the entire sets of deep peptide that are being uh, identified in patient um, produced by the C9 R72. So HSBB8 not only recognizes me for the protein, but any type of protein, maybe with strange conformation, we do not know how, but you recognize this, and th th it able to direct the degradation of the protein by autophagy, so they solve the problem of the insufficient uh, autophagy flux, of the blockage of autophagy flux, and restoring the normal function in the cells to clear the way the, the, the misfold the proteins and the this peptide. The entire work I show you was done in cells. What's about animal models? Unfortunately, there are no mice that overexpress B8, so we cannot do this experiment at the moment unless we have to produce the mice. But there is a nice report, actually, using an homolog of HSPB8, and a surprising was found in Erpen simplex virus type 2. This protein is highly homolog of HSPB8. This is contained in this virus. So these authors have infected SOD mice, they are model of ALS, with this uh, with, with a viral vector containing this protein. And actually, they were able to see that uh, a protective effect of the, the homolog of HSBB8 in these mice, because there was a delay in the onset and the progression in these mice, was a, a protection in a neuromuscular junction that are normally lost in these mice. And uh, there is inhibition of motor neurons at that. So it seems that this. Uh, homolog can work in mice, so uh, not only in cells. We uh, have done some study in Drosophila. Uh, this was done by Serena Cava. We are collaborating in all these studies with her and in Modena. And those are um, a fly that expressed a mutant uh, TDP43, a mutant in, uh, a nuclear localization signal. And this uh, fly have a damage at the level of the eye. If you overexpress the ortholog of, of HSPB8, you reduce the accumulation of TDP43 and you rescue the eye phenotype. If you silence the um, 
ortholog, HSP B8 ortholog in mice, in fly, uh, this one, you end up with a, you worsen the, the phenotype. So you have a, 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 a increase in the damage at the high level. With this, that is mimicking the familiar formula less, but we also use the, t the 35 fragment that mimics the uh, sporadic form of ALS. This is lethal in, in fly at the pupa level, but if you uh, have uh, overexpressed the ortholog of HSBB8 in this fly, actually at least the, the fly uh, are alive. They're not performed very well, but actually it's an indication that there's an improvement uh, in the mice. So the toxicity of TDP43 is counteracted by the uh, HSBB8. What is the mechanism of action? Uh, we know that uh, autophagy is involved, but wh how does it work? In muscle, uh, it is very well understand that, uh, understood that the uh, HSBB8 work in physiological condition uh, because it recognizes the protein that are damaged during physical exercise. When you run too much, you have carbonylation of proteins in muscle, have to be removed. They are very similar to misfolded proteins. And in muscle, HSBB8 work in conjunction with BAC3 and the, uh, the system of the chapel, which is HS70, and the ubiquitin 18 enzyme chip. Uh, for months, we try to see if the same complex is present in motor neuronal cells, but we always fail to detect the complex. So we try to immunoprecipitate the SOD1, and we were unable to see the components of the complex. And we need to see the co immunoprecipitation to prove that the HSPB8 recognizing misfolded substrate and form a complex that has to be sent to the autophagosome. But then we, we reason that maybe if you try to look at the immunoprecipitation in this condition, as soon as the complex is formed, <coughs> the complex is already inserted in your, your autophagosome and it will be immediately cleared away. So you, you cannot detect the complex unless you block autophagy. So we try to block autophagy uh, with bifilomycin and we fail to detect the complex. That's usually happen when you try to do a, a very good experiment. But then the problem is maybe you act too late. The autophagosomes are already formed, you have the complex inserted, and the complex is disassembled. What about you use another inhibitor of autophagy that block the formation of the autophagosome? So if the complex is formed, but you prevent the insertion of the complex to the autophagosomes, you, do see, you should see the accumulation of the complex. So you, can, you may be able to immunoprecipitate this protein. And this is exactly what happened. If you're immunoprecipitated, SOD1, when, you block, when we block autophagy with 3MA, so we prevent the insertion of the complex into autophagosomes, we have the entire complex of BAG1, HSBB8, HSC70, and CHIP that come down. So now we know that in motor neurons that express uh, misfolded proteins, we have exactly the same response that it's normally present in physiological condition in muscle for many, for, for different reasons. <coughs> um, but this make the story more clear. Because now we know that the complex is formed uh, from the literature, we also know that HSC70 and CHIP also work in the other arm of the uh, protein quality control system, in, in conjunction with another nuclear exchange factor, BAG1, it directed the gradation of the protein to the proteasome. So the defect may be really uh, a very low level of HSPP8, in, uh, at least in our cell system. I'm not saying that this is uh, the only important protein in, 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 in our model, but I'm sure this is a very important player in this story. So the problem is we have a defect of HSPB8. If we overexpress bacteria, BAC3, not in change, because in the cells we already have a very high level of BAC3, and we have a huge amount of HSC70 and CHIP. So the limiting factor has to be uh, HSPB8. So we can try an approach here. We can not uh, bring the HSPB8 inside the motor neurons of patient. But we can try to pharmacologically induce the expression of HSBB8 with small molecules. This is easy. Oh, it can be easy. So we can uh, start, we have started um, a sort of screening to find if there is the possibility to induce pharmacologically HSBB8 specifically in neuronal cells. We um, thought can uh, promote the region of the human HSPB8 gene fused to the luciferase, we produce cells, and we start a screening of um, 
the entire pool of FDA-approved drug that are available, commercially available, uh, is a NIH library, uh, plus some um, natural compound. Uh, the, the, the problem is you have to find a, a safe drug if you want to start a, a treatment, especially if you want to start a treatment at the early stage of the disease, because this has to be a chronic treatment for the entire life. So you cannot find a drug that has to screen for toxicity, etc. And we were lucky enough to find some good eats. Some were uh, uh, estrogens, and actually um, HSPB-8 is controlled by estrogens. Another story that is linked to HSPB-8 is the overinduction of HSPB-8 in the, in the breast cancer cells make it worse in the situation because it allowed the cells to resist to stress much better. Uh, we perform a secondary screening on uh, neuronal cells, S, uh, H, S, uh, Y, Phi, Y. They unfortunately do not contain estrogen receptors, so we cannot prove that, but we have proved in another cells that estrogens induce uh, the, the protein, uh, the HSPB8. We found two drugs, colchicine and doxorubicin. Unfortunately, doxorubicin is not a good candidate because it's an inhibitor of topoisomerase, it's a <laughs> chemotherapy, and it's not a drug that you can use for chronic treatment, but at least can tell you uh, if you can find a mechanism. We found colchicine, which is not bad, actually, because it's, uh, it has been used to treat gut and uh, actually also in atrial fibrillation. It uh, inhibits uh, microtuber polymerization, but it's very well tolerated uh, low doses, even for a chronic usage. So we are starting at this point to characterize these two drugs when we have prove that there is a very nice uh, dose-dependent induction of HSBB8 fivefold over the control. This is the top that we can reach by when we inhibit the proteasm. And we cannot reach this induction in, in, in normal condition, but fivefold is enough, even in the protein, both with colchicine and doxorubicin. They also induce an entire set of proteins that are linked to autophagy, like TFAB. It is a master regulator of autophagy. LC3 and PCC2, that are two markers I showed you before, but they are actively involved in autophagy. So not only induce this chaperone, but the entire downstream uh, degradative system. So maybe a, a very interesting candidate drugs. This is true for colchicine and it's true for doxorubicin and actually they are able to remove uh, the insoluble species that accumulate if you overexpress large amount of TDP43 full length they, you can measure on that but it's a very very high overexpression or the TDP uh, 25 kilodalton fragment is remove one new tree with this drug. I must say that uh, Oh, we have perfect in time. Uh, I must say that uh, we uh, have silenced uh, HSBB8 in this condition, and we do still see um, effect of the drug. It's not at the same level, so HSBB8 is important, but it's probably not the only uh, player that is uh, activated by this drug uh, to uh, uh, enhance the clearance of this uh, misfolded protein from the cells. Uh, maybe many uh, other uh, uh, stress-induced uh, chaperones are involved. We are studying that. So I think I can stop here. Uh, what I can summarize of this series of uh, picture I show you is that in, in, in motor neurons, the misfolded proteins are accumulated because of insufficient proteasm system, but mm, uh, also and probably most relevant autophagic flux blockage. But the aggregation and autophagic flux blockage can be counteracted, can be reduced by the overexpression of HSPB8, which bind the uh, bug 3 HSP70 and chip in cells and in animal model. This equilibrium, I didn't spend too much time on that, but is finally tuned by the uh, level of bug 3 and bug 1. We have the data that prove that. Um, BAG1 directed degradation to the proteasome, BAG3 with HSPB8 uh, to uh, autophagy, and this solved the problem of autophagic flux blockage. And we believe that if we induce even as uh, the single protein, but maybe a series of protein that work in conjunction in motor neuronal cells with small drug, we can enhance the capability of these uh, motor neurons 
to counteract the toxicity of the process, so to better survive in this condition for a longer time. And this is really important because if you just delay, if you reduce the toxicity, you delay maybe the onset in the familiar form, and you know exactly in the familiar form the cause of the disease, or maybe the progression in, in a sporadic form. Maybe this is possible with classical drug. We don't know yet, but we have to test this in, in mice as soon as possible. And I want to thank all the people in the, in the lab, especially Valeria Krippa for all the studies that have been done on the LS models, uh, Paola Rosmini for the uh, SBMA models, uh, Riccardo Cristofaniozzo and Maria Elena Ciccardi, and a very nice collaboration with Serena Carra in Modena. Uh, the entire set of experiments I show you was done in collaboration with her and the collaboration with Alessandro Provenzani at Sibio for the high throughput screening and uh, many other collaborations we had uh, during the year. And, and thanks to you for your attention. Thank you.